Hello and welcome to Advancing Adventism. Our topic in this video is justification, but we're going to be covering it from an angle that you might not have really considered before, so I hope you stick around. Now it's pretty common in the SDA church to have discussions over whether we're justified by faith or by works or both. But if we're talking about being justified by faith or by works, and yet don't have a clear understanding of what justification itself is, well, then even if we answer by faith or by works, it wouldn't really result in a clear understanding of the overall subject. So in this video, we're going to talk about what is justification. So first, let's break down the word a little. Justification. So we can break this word up into three segments. The base is just. And actually, the IFI part in the middle is a modification of IFY, which means to make, to cause to be, to become whatever the base word is. So purify means to make pure. Diversify means to make diverse. Simplify means to make simple. And the list goes on. So justify, obviously, simply means to make just. Okay, so now to the last part of the word, A-T-I-O-N. The C actually is just there to connect justify with this suffix, A-T-I-O-N. So what does the A-T-I-O-N part mean? It's what you put onto the end of a verb to make it into a noun that refers to the action or process of the verb taking place. It is the act of doing whatever the verb is. For example, purification is the act of making something pure. Diversification is the act of making something diverse. Simplification is the act of making simple. And of course, justification following the same pattern is the act of making something or someone just. Notice in its simple meaning, justification isn't about declaring someone to be just or about considering someone to be just, but instead it's simply about making someone just. This leads us to the next issue. What does it mean to be just? Well, let's start with a well-known phrase from scripture. The just shall live by his faith, Habakkuk 2.4. The Hebrew word that is translated just here is Sadiq. But both in the King James and pretty much every other translation, it's also translated as righteous much of the time. For example, the Berean Standard Bible translates this same verse, the righteous will live by faith. Just and righteous are synonyms and both are common translation choices for the Hebrew word tzadik. Basically, when you're reading the Old Testament in an English translation and you come across either of the terms the just or the righteous, there's a very good chance the Hebrew word there is tzadik. Tzadik is actually an adjective, but it is often used on its own, not modifying a noun, but as a noun itself. And this is what we see in these uh, passages in this passage here. The just or the righteous means the just person or the righteous person. A noun. A single English word that captures the idea really well here is right doer. To be a righteous or just person is to be a right doer. Why? Well, because righteousness is right doing. And actually, Ellen White says that very thing. She said, righteousness is right doing in Christ's Object Lessons, page 312. So again, a just person is a right doer and a righteous person is a right doer. Basically, as I just said, just and righteous are synonyms and their meaning has to do with rightness, particularly in the moral domain. And this can be borne out even further by looking at the root of the word we just spoke of, tzaddik. So we say tzaddik if we're talking about one person, but if we want to refer to more than one person, more than one right doer, in Hebrew, we would tag on the plural suffix I am, im, which makes it tzadikim. And the root of tzadik or tzadikim 
is sadak, which means right. And if we want the Hebrew word for righteousness, well, that's tzedakah. As we already saw, righteousness is right doing. And in Hebrew, this word really does refer to concrete actions of doing what's right. So it would be better translated as right doing. It's pretty cool how Ellen White's understanding of righteousness matches perfectly with the meaning of the Hebrew terms. Now for some broader context, the Hebrew word for wicked is reshaim. The root of reshaim is rasha, which means wrong. So reshaim being plural literally means those who do wrong or wrongdoers. So according to the meaning of these Hebrew words, the righteous are right doers and the wicked are wrongdoers. Okay, so let's make sure we're understanding the true simplicity of the lesson here. From what we just learned, just and righteous are synonyms. So we could replace the base word just with the word righteous and say justification is the same thing as righteousification. And although that's not a standard English word, we can all grasp its meaning. It means the action or process of making someone righteous or being changed into a right doer. Likewise, we can see that justification is to be changed into a right doer. We've seen that this is the straightforward meaning of the English term and that this matches the straightforward meaning of the Hebrew terms for righteousness or right doing as well. And actually, there's a statement by Paul that flat out says this. Romans 5, 16 through 19. In these verses we're about to go over, we're going to see that Paul uses justification and being made right in parallel. In other words, you're going to see that he expresses an idea one way, and then he expresses the same idea in a slightly different way in the next verse. So what in one statement he calls justification, in the next statement he calls being made righteous. So, verse 16 reads, Again, the gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment that followed one sin brought condemnation, but the gift that followed many trespasses brought justification. So first, Paul mentions the one man's sin, which is a reference to Adam's sin, and then Paul mentions in contrast the gift that brought justification. So let's continue with verse 17, which reads, For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive an abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Again, here we see Paul is saying the same basic thing. First, he mentions the sin or trespass of the one man, a reference again to Adam, and he sets that in contrast with the gift of righteousness that Jesus brings. So we have the same thought expressed in two different ways. The way Paul puts it in verse 16 is that the one man sinned, but the gift brought justification. And the way he puts it in verse 17 is that the one man trespassed, but the gift Jesus brings is the gift of righteousness. The parallels are very obvious and make it plain that sin and trespass are being used synonymously. In other words, when he says the one man's sin and the trespass of the one man, he's referring to the same thing. Likewise, in both verses 16 and 17, he contrasts Adam's sin with the gift. Okay. In verse 16, it's the gift that brings justification. And in verse 17, it's the gift of righteousness. They're clearly the same thing, which means that receiving justification and receiving righteousness are the exact same thing. Now let's continue with verses 18 and 19. Uh, verse 18 reads, So then, just as one trespass brought condemnation for all men, so also one act of righteousness brought justification and life for all men. And verse 19 reads, For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. In these verses, we have the same sort of thing going on here, where Paul expresses the same basic thought with different nuances in different ways in each verse. In 18, he says that one trespass brought condemnation. 
In verse 19, he expresses the same basic thought by saying that through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners. So that's the negative side. Now here's the positive side. In verse 18, he says that one act of righteousness brought justification. Then he expresses this same thought in verse 19 by saying that through the obedience of one man, many will be made righteous. In other words, Paul's saying that being justified is the same thing as being made righteous. And again, what is righteousness? It's right doing. So to be made righteous is to be made a right doer. And this is confirmed in the next chapter, Romans 6. Now we're not going to take time to read it now, but I really recommend reading it as soon as you're able. And when you do that, keep all the things we just went over in mind so that we, you can really grasp what Paul is trying to tell us. But in a nutshell, Paul warns against sinning. And he says that those who sin are free from righteousness. And he also says that those who serve Christ are free from sin. And it's clear that he doesn't mean anything theoretical by this since he spells out that he's talking about yielding our body parts either to commit sin or to do righteousness. The point is basically that we can't serve two masters. We either serve Satan by sinning and thus aren't righteous at all, or we serve God by keeping his commandments and are actually righteous in practical reality. Now, the thought that justification is to be accounted righteous, even while still committing sins, isn't found anywhere in the scriptures. In fact, that idea is opposite of what it means to be justified as we've just seen. To be justified means a person is made just or made righteous, as we just, as we just went over. It's about a change in the person, not about a change in how God views the person. Being made righteous is to be made a consistent right doer in our day-to-day -day lives, walking as Christ walked, rejecting all sin, and practicing actual right doing. And there's many passages of scripture that teach this, but we're going to wrap up our discussion today by looking at just one. 1 John 3, 5 through 10. Let's read it, and then I'll point out a few things about it. You know that he, Jesus, was revealed to take away our sins and no sin is in him. Whoever remains in him doesn't sin. Whoever sins hasn't seen him and doesn't know him. Little children, let no one lead you astray. He who does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. To this end, the Son of God was revealed, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever is born of God doesn't commit sin because his seed remains in him, and he can't sin because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are revealed and the children of the devil. So the first thing we're going to point out here is that Jesus came to take away our sins. And it actually tells us in the previous verse what sin is. It's transgression of the law, as you know. So Jesus came to take away our law breaking. If we continue in law-breaking, if we continue in sin, it says we don't know Christ. Then notice it says, little children, let no one lead you astray. Clearly, God knew his people might be led astray on this point, so he warns them. This should get our attention, and we should make sure we're paying attention and ready to understand what it says next. And it says next, he who does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. So clearly, righteousness isn't something abstract that's attributed to people who don't actually have it. It's something that is done, something that is carried out in our practical experience. It's not he who professes belief in God who is righteous, nor does it say that the one who believes that Jesus died for his sins is righteous, but it says he who does righteousness is righteous, that's the one who's righteous, even as Jesus is righteous, or in the exact same way that Jesus is righteous. Continuing, it says, he who sins is of the devil. Now, obviously, someone who's righteous is not of the devil, but since someone who sins is of the devil, that shows us that someone who has been made righteous is someone who doesn't continue sinning, which is actually what it says in the verses that follow. It says, whoever is born of God doesn't commit sin. 
Lastly, it tells us that this is how the children of God and the children of the devil are revealed. If God's justified children still sin, just like those who aren't justified, then whether we sin or do righteousness wouldn't reveal whether we are children of God or children of the devil. But this is saying actually doing righteousness versus actually doing sin is indeed what distinguishes between those who serve God and those who serve Satan. Now, what all this means is that the righteousness offered in the gospel isn't a theory. God doesn't offer us a justification that is in name only. He actually wants to make us righteous so we no longer live our old life of sin, but instead live out Christ's life, which means utterly abandoning sin and walking fully in obedience to God. We'll have much more on this topic in the future. And we have plenty of videos on other important topics as well already. So if you'd like to hear more of the sorts of things you heard in this video, I recommend subscribing and checking out the other videos on this channel. Thanks for watching and many blessings.